Um, I'm delighted to introduce you to Sean Mink, an award-winning teacher, an author, a curriculum writer, and maybe most importantly, a dad. Sean's current research includes creating equitable spaces for all student voices while integrating students' passions into K-12 classrooms. There's a quote that reminds me of Sean. Courage doesn't always roar. I want to recognize his immense courage in putting together the story he's about to tell you. Please welcome Sean Mink. Welcome to ShadowCon Chicago. Oh, nope. <laughs> Welcome to ShadowCon uh, Georgia, St. Louis. I don't know, where are we now? Los Angeles. Welcome to ShadowCon Los Angeles. Woo! It took a while. How's it feel to be here? I know, it feels pretty good. Before I start, I want to say a couple of things to my wonderful speakers. I think we all look good in our dresses today. Best part about wearing a kilt, you don't have to check the zipper when you're going on stage. So, I'm the reason why they gave the disclaimer. So I'm gonna pause for a moment before I get started with my story that I'm gonna tell you. And I'm just gonna acknowledge that this is a sensitive subject matter. And I'm also gonna say that I will linger in this room. And for those of you in YouTube world, and whenever you watch the video, you will have my information. I want to be that person to have that conversation with you that your soul needs and you haven't had. So I'll be here as long as you need to talk about whatever you want. If there's anything that's brought up about your past, I want you to tell yourself these four words. It's not your fault. The reason why I'm talking about this today is because I want to create space to see what math means to our students because students are living things I'm gonna talk about right now. I'm gonna go back into the classroom on Monday and I have students who are dealing with these types of things. And if we don't take time to see our students, they're never gonna see the mathematics. It's important that we see them first. So, I don't have a lot of memories when I was growing up. I have maybe two or three concrete memories prior to middle school. One of those concrete memories is when I was walking down my elementary school hallway and I noticed that I started counting all the tiles. Say that to somebody who's not a math person and they <laughs> have no idea what you're talking about. They just think you're kind of weird. But then I realized I wasn't gonna be able to count all the tiles. So instead, what I did as I walked was I started counting the number of times that I stepped on each different colored tile. This is gonna make sense in a second because I'm gonna tell you a lifetime secret. I've kept this to myself my entire life. It's taken a lot of work and a lot of effort to do this and I'm gonna blow it in the next five <laughs> seconds. But first I wanna realize that as I was supposed to take this to my grave, there came a point in time where I read a book about a man who outed himself in his mid 50s, hid dyslexia his, his whole life. So I figured life's too short, death's too long, and our students are too important. So, thank you. I'm also gonna take strength from my daughter. Stand up, <laughs> please. Why are you crying already, it's okay. <laughs> she has ADHD. She was diagnosed in the middle of second grade and she has owned it with pride her entire life because she realizes that that is a part of who she is, but that is nowhere near who she is. She's been bullied in, throughout school, in dance, but she's always beautifully accepted herself for who she is. And I realize I haven't been doing that. So I'm gonna do that right now in the next few seconds and say no one knows until now that, whew, this is harder to say than I thought it would be. Oh, and by the way, I did tell my family a couple hours before, so don't act surprised, <laughs> that I have uh, OCD, or obsessive compulsive disorder. Took five seconds to blow four decades of a secret. Great, no turning back now. There's some misconceptions about disabilities, and we know as math teachers that if you have certain disabilities, they're exacerbated in mathematics classrooms. Take my daughter, for example, with ADHD. There's a reason, oh, oh wait, squirrel. 
that doesn't mean you have ADHD if you get distracted. It just means you like squirrels, maybe. Same thing with OCD. If you like your pencils neatly in a row, that doesn't mean you have OCD. If you clean your house for a couple of hours, that doesn't mean you have OCD. It just, well, it means you're a clean person. The point in time where you realize you might have OCD is when you're frozen in repetitive thoughts illogically linked to consequences. One of the points in time where I realized that I had OCD was when I was standing there getting ready to go to work, staring at a stove over and over again for 45 minutes, not able to leave, knowing that I could leave if I just wrapped my head around the fact that everything's gonna be okay. But what happened was I would look at it, I would walk away, and as I'm walking back the 17th time, it's this, something happens in your brain to where if you do not go back and look at that one more time, something bad's gonna happen. And it has nothing at all to do with the stove. There's different types of OCD. I am organization, which means this is a true picture. Last place, by the way, working out is great. <laughs> the last place I worked out in a public setting, it went from looking like this to looking like this. And that 30 right there that's slightly off bothers me to this day. <laughs> so I do not have contamination, so hug me whenever you want. I do have intrusive thoughts. My intrusive thoughts are not of harm coming to me. It's of harm coming to the ones that I love the most. I do not have ruminations, but I do have checking. To the extreme, I have checking all the time. When I walked up those stairs, I did it in a pattern that corresponds to my OCD. The thing about OCD is you have to have a biological predisposition, but then something usually needs to happen in your environment to trigger it. And my environmental trigger was an abusive household. I would use compulsion to escape my thoughts of abuse. Just to kind of set the stage a little bit, in my house, it's kind of like I've seen tornadoes start to form. You start seeing them swirl. And you know that there's nothing you can do that's going to stop that storm from coming. That's kind of like what it was like growing up in my household, where you heard the words, you saw the anger, you searched for a way to stop that storm from coming, but you knew there was nothing that you could do to stop it from coming. I went back this summer to take a picture of the house that I grew up in in middle school. Something happened one night in this house. And this is a point in time where I'm going to tell you, I'm going to leave out most of the details, but I am here for any conversations. I'm an open book. If you want to hear them later, just ask. But I will tell you that this night in particular was pretty bad. First, my mother started with the belt. Then she handed it to my father. He started beating me until he lost control of the belt. It wrapped around, hit me in the groin, and I fell to my knees. He continued and told me when it stopped until I stood back up and I believed him, so eventually I stood back up. He was a man of his word and he stopped and the last thing I remember that night was falling back to the ground and passing out. The next morning, I realized that, and now also, there's scars that we carry with us and we all have some to certain degrees and we learn to bury those scars so deeply that we forget they're there. For me, I don't think about this night all that often, but every once in a while, there's a couple of scars left on my body from this night, and when I catch a glimpse of it, I think, oh uh, yeah, that, that really happened. The thing about it to realize is you start, learn, you start learning to question reality. It's a matter of how can the same hand that reaches out to you in love an hour later reach out to you with such anger and hatred? And you're filled with a sense of despair. How can I know so much? in control so very little. The next day I was walking down this very street to my middle school classroom and I was thinking about one thing the entire time as the buses were going by. I was thinking about this chair. Now there were times in the past where I used to go in after a night of being abused and sit in the chair and I could always cope with it because if it was on the back I could lean forward, I could tilt one of my butt cheeks up, or if it's on the lower part of your thigh, you could go up and releve. Yeah, I do ballet, sorry. You can go up and releve, and you can keep the part of your body off the plastic. But on this particular morning, I knew I was going to have to sit still in this chair all day, and there was no way I was going to be able to pivot. So I made a decision. I decided that there's only a finite amount of pain that I could go through in my life. 
what if I took all the pain that I was going to have to experience and just put it into one singular moment? I decided definitively at that moment that the next bus that came along, I was going to commit suicide. The thing about that realization is when you come to that point, it's not a matter about wanting to die. It's more a matter about not wanting to live anymore. And as I was walking down, I saw this tree. And my OCD kicked into the extreme. This was taken in the summer. I should have gone back in the fall and taken the picture. The leaves had fallen. You could see the branches. And I started OCDing this tree like crazy. I started counting all the branches. And then I realized there's no way I'm going to be able to count all the branches. So I started thinking to myself, what if there's a pattern to these branches? And if I can figure out the pattern to the branches, then I don't have to count all the branches, but I'll know all the branches that were there. And I was, as I was sitting there counting all the branches, boom, the bus went by. And I missed it, and I heard it. And I didn't care because I was just stuck in the mathematics of this tree. And that's the reason why I say mathematics saved my life. Now, there's a thing about this. Let's start getting into the mathematics. I didn't know at the time, but this was all about fractals. The branches, the striations. And the thing about fractals is they're, well, I'm not going to read the definition because the definition is a little boring to me. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the origin of the term. It's Latin. It's fractus. It translates as fractured or broken. So there I was, fractured and broken, looking at something that by mathematical definition is fractured and broken. So the fractured and broken part of the tree, nature, mathematics of the tree, triggered my fractured and broken OCD, which changed the most and saved the most fractured and broken part of myself. And then I started to realize after that, once I learned what fractals are, is they are everywhere. They're in our lungs. They're in our veins. They're in the leaves. They're in the sky, in the lightning. They're in the rivers. They're in the sand as the water washes back to the ocean. Right about this point in time, you might be thinking to yourself, where's the math in this talk? And that's all the math you're going to get in this talk, because I don't want to contradict what I'm about to say next which is, in my opinion, there is way too much mathematics in our math classrooms. Thank you. <laughs> Let me say that a little differently. There's way too much of our mathematics in math classrooms. <laughs> because my mathematics that saved my life never existed in my math classrooms when I was a student. So what I'm asking here is where's their mathematics in our math classrooms? I don't know if you've seen this posted on social media before. I totally get this picture. It resonates with me. I mean, I think formulas and equations are beautiful if we do it right. But I see what they're saying about the beauty and the pattern and playing with ideas in mathematics. That's what we want our classroom to look like. But I'm going to push us a little farther. And I'm going to say, if we're talking about the beauty of mathematics, Whose beauty, whose patterns, and whose ideas are we talking about? Because it's all still mine. There's a Buddhist saying, the finger that points at the moon is not the moon. I think about that a lot in terms of mathematics, and that the symbols are not the mathematics. It's pointing to what the, math the mathematics means. And in that same vein, the mathematics is within us all. So even when I'm talking about math, I'm not talking about math. I try to create time and space for my students to be comfortable to tell me their stories so that we can learn together. Like there was a student about a month ago who came up to me and said that they were getting their blood drawn. We started a conversation. They were feeling me out to see if I was amiable to that conversation. And then they bridged the conversation. To they, they got their blood drawn so they could, they could get a baseline because they were going to start hormonal therapy and transitioning. We started talking about the mathematics behind that, but I'm going to tell you right now, even though we've talked about that mathematically, the math in that conversation did not matter nearly as much as that person. Every single subject matter is just a different way of making sense of our world. My way of making sense of the world, especially with the OCD, is mathematical. But all of the mathematics I used never came from the mathematics classrooms that I was a student in. And I know I might offend some people. I mean, no offense. But when we say we want to rehumanize mathematics, I get what you're saying. 
but I think we are hitting the target and we are missing the mark because we do not need to rehumanize mathematics. Instead, what we need to do is stop dehumanizing it. I want my students to know that they matter more than the math. I want my students to be a voice, their voice, not an echo of my voice. Because profound things happen when one human being lets another human being know that their voice matters. Yeah, tell the mathematician's stories, tell our stories, but I tell those stories so that I can make way so I can hear my students' stories, both mathematical and non-mathematical. I'm glad I literally and metaphorically missed the bus. <laughs> but I realized before and after that, my experience in math classroom was a sense of being enveloped in an embrace of logical calmness, which helped me to escape what was going on at home. I still have OCD, I still have organization, intrusive thoughts and checking, and I wanna take a, just a second to apologize to, well, my daughter, and to, don't cry, you're gonna make me cry, aw. <laughs> Let me see. Probably wants to stay with you. And some lipstick. So <laughs> I'm just going to say I'm sorry for lying to you my whole life by omission, but this kid's a rock star. When I told her a couple hours ago that I had OCD, her first words were, wait, what? And then five seconds later, she's like, that explains everything. <laughs> so, and I share that sentiment with everybody I've ever loved before and known before. I'm sorry that I lied to you about part of who I am. So here's my call to action, a mild call to action. Thanks. No, I'm not selling t-shirts. They're free. There's not too many of them, but if you want to grab a t-shirt and wear it tomorrow, my math story is great, but I want to start hashtagging your math story. So if you want to put a shirt on, do so, but you make the commitment to wear it tomorrow and go to people and ask them about their math story. Sure, share yours with them, but let them share theirs because I'm sharing my story with you today so that you can share your story with others so we can get ready so our students can share their stories in our classrooms. This is zero caffeine needed, not much effort. Another mild commitment, and all of this is gonna be on my website, www.seannank.com. So don't worry about uh, remembering it all. This year I decided that I usually put a bunch of stuff up on my walls and it's things that the students don't care about. So I stripped my walls. I put 10% of my walls were for me. The other 90% started like this. I left blank and I told students, bring things in that you're passionate about. Put stuff on our walls that makes you happy in our math classroom. There's a couple other mild calls. This one's a little more in depth, some caffeine needed. I created with a colleague a passion project where you group students according to their passion and the project is them making a two, video, two minute video where they find the grade level appropriate mathematics inherent in their passion. I wanna hear their passion through the mathematics. Another one that I'll offer with much caffeine needed is a series of three workshops because if anybody tells you they figured this out, uh, I don't think they have. I haven't figured this out, I'm tr still trying to. But I wanna come together so that we will realize the answers to the questions we haven't even thought of yet in, student, in terms of creating more space for student voice. So I'm gonna say join me, that was some heavy stuff. Take a breath. Let's go relax after this. Let's have a beer or more. <laughs> Let's maybe dance a little bit laugh, but more than anything else, I want to be there to be able to hear your stories so you can hear your students' stories, so we can see them, so that they can see the mathematics. And to encapsulate the entire evening, I'm going to try this off the cuff, and I'm going to say, let's dive into mathematics while becoming a mather, having joy in it, and tell our stories about it. So, thank you.